I'm really excited to be here and to move to the state of Maine. As Charlie mentioned, my husband and I have been wanting to get back to the East Coast for some time now, to be closer to family, to raise our own, and I'm especially excited to be part of the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences with all of the advancements they've made in the facilities. It's a truly awesome place to work besides um, become, becoming colleagues with many of the fabulous researchers there. And I wanted to kick off today's talk by first asking the members of the audience how many of you by show of hands have ever snorkeled or scuba dived on a coral reef in your life? Oh goodness, that's excellent. <laughs> well, hopefully I'll be showing you some pictures that look familiar, maybe others don't look so familiar, but obviously you all care quite a bit about coral reefs too. If you've seen them, you know how fragile they can be and um, maybe you've heard a bit about the losses they suffered over recent years. And giving a talk about coral reef ecology can sometimes be depressing. Often coral reef ecologists are called doom and gloom scientists because we don't have a lot of good things to say about the current state of coral reefs in the world. But I'm hoping to end the talk today with some glimmers of hope of how these reefs may be more resilient than we initially thought. And I won't spend too much time then um, going over basic coral reef ecology. Many of you know that reefs are made of corals that act as bioengineers. So they create the 3D structure that creates the complex habitats for many organisms to hide in, in the reef, including many species of fish and invertebrates. So they act kind of like trees in a rainforest. But corals are neither plants nor are they all animal. They're a mix of the two. They're a group of species that interact together in a symbiotic nature. So um, the coral itself is made of the calcium carbonate plate and on top of that plate is a thin layer of tissue, like a skin, and that's the live part of the coral, which is an animal, an invertebrate organism, and there's actually several thousands of organisms in a single coral species because each coral is a colony of thousands of polyps, like um, what you see up in the top corner there. And within each of those polyps is the symbiotic dinoflagellate algae called the zooxanthellae that lives within the coral tissues. And this mutualistic relationship is set up where the dinoflagellate gives sugars to the coral animal as it photosynthesizes, and in turn, the coral gives the algae a safe place to harbor. So corals feed both by getting food from that symbiotic algae, but also by feeding directly from the water column. Each individual polyp is essentially a mouth and a gut, and those um, tentacles will wave around and grab particles that pass through the water column and pull, pull it into the gut to get nutrition. And so for that reason, coral reefs have also been referred to as a sea of mouths because there's so much filter feeding happening across this bottom. It creates this crystal clear gin-like water over these um, truly spectacular systems. And because of the complex 3D structure that corals provide with their calcium carbonate skeleton, they can be a host to a huge amount of diversity in these really neat ecosystems. In fact, there was a study done recently in collaboration with a project called BioCode and with the National Geographic, where a photographer in this upper corner here took just a cubic foot um, quadrat, essentially, and put it in many different ecosystems, including coral reefs, and then counted all the organisms that passed through that cubic foot that were larger than a millimeter in size, and found in this one reef system over 600 species of plants, animals, various organisms passing through that, that box. And that's vastly larger number of species than were found in tropical rainforests, grasslands, and elsewhere. So these are really, truly diverse ecosystems. So where are coral reefs found? They're typically found in the tropics. And although you'll find different coral species that are maybe living singular as uh, cup corals or, or polyps in areas as remote as the polar regions or down at deeper depths in the sea, the truly reef building or reef forming species are all centered in the tropics. And you may have heard of the coral triangle, which is really the epicenter of the global diversity of coral reefs found in this triangular region here in the Indo-Pacific. And it's host to hundreds of coral species, thousands of fish species, and six out of the sea turtle species. So it's really a biodiversity hotspot that supports millions of people living off of this ecosystem. And despite the, um, the kind of well-documented and known diversity of these systems and the number of people living off of these ecosystems, 
the study of coral reefs or coral reef ecology is really a, a pretty young science in general. So here's just a simple graph over time of the number of studies being published about coral reefs um, in, in the primary literature and the scientific literature. And you can see there wasn't really an uptick in the study of coral reefs until the 1980s. So it's a very recent science. I'm going to walk you through kind of a timeline now since the, the, theory, the, the theme of this summer series is 40 years in the history of, of, in my instance, coral reefs to match the 40 year anniversary of the Bigelow Lab. And I'll, I'm going to start a little bit further back with Joe Connell, who was the pioneer, really, of ecology in general. He's often been referred to as the grandfather of ecology. But he was also the first to study the maintenance and function of biodiversity on coral reef ecosystems. And actually, for those of you who might not be aware, Charles Yench, the founder of the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences, also did quite a bit of research on coral reefs in Florida, looking at irradiance and photosynthesis of those symbiotic algae within the corals. Following not long behind him was a, a fellow named Rob Dunbar. He's given um, some TED Talks. You can find his work online if you're interested. But he started pioneering uh, biogeochemical methods to retrospectively analyze climate change based on ice cores and cores taken from coral reefs. And I'll walk you through how some of that works later on. Now, while these guys may seem to be doing disparate studies in a similar ecosystem, they all came together in 1991 and met in Miami, Florida for one of the very first um, workshops sponsored by NSF, the National Science Foundation, the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, and EPA to start discussing how global climate change can affect coral reefs. Following not long behind them, Bob Stenick stepped into the scene. You might recognize this name. He's a scientist out of the University of Maine who's really well known for his work on lobsters on this coast. But he's also spent just about half his career studying coral reef ecosystems and um, specifically looking at reef function and resilience. Why do I bring all these fellows up? Well, I was born in the late 70s, 1970s, and then in the mid-90s, I took my first trip with an ecological study group um, from high school to a coral reef in Florida. And when I got there and finally got the chance to get underwater, I was disappointed, frankly. <laughs> the state of the reef didn't look anything like I had expected it to. Where were all the colorful corals? Where were all the, the numerous fish? So I started becoming concerned right away about where am I ever going to get the chance to see a coral reef? And I really wanted to study them and their resilience. So I started my PhD at UC Santa Barbara, which is where Joe Connell was still holding office space as a professor emeritus. And I would have discussions with him about diversity on coral reefs. And at that time, I also had the chance to meet Bob Stenick at a workshop. And we were uh, following similar lines of research. So we started collaborating at that point as well. When I moved to Scripps, although Rob was part of the, the faculty at Stanford, we were both on a consortium of, of a working a group of people that were going to really remote islands in the Central Pacific. And I started working with him on carbon cycling on coral reefs and what the changing amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere meant for those processes. And now here I am coming back full circle to Bigelow Labs. And I just only hope to follow in the footsteps of Charles and uh, bring back the study of coral reef systems to, to Maine. <laughs> okay. So one of the reasons I'm really excited to be here at Bigelow is all of the new technology and facilities that are available there. And really, those kinds of technological advancements are what spurned a lot of the exploration of, on coral reefs that's happened in recent history. So I'm going to walk you through some of those things that have allowed us to better reach these ecosystems and share what's happening with these e ecosystems with other folks. One of the first limitations was the ability to get underwater. And naturally, Jacques Cousteau inspired lots of young scientists to become scuba divers with his invention of the, the aqua lung. And Lloyd Bridges popularized recreational diving in the 1960s. But really, using scuba diving as a tool for research didn't come about until the 1980s, when a series of certifications and training procedures really made it feasible for dorky scientists to get underwater and stay alive and come back up with some data. So that's when uh, diving on coral reefs for research really took off. Prior to that point, this is Joe Connell, that the grandfather of, of ecology, used um, 
imaging techniques to follow trajectories of corals over time. But he was really limited in his access to the reefs. He could only get out there at low tide when he can practically, as you can see, walk along the reef flat. And he was using still images above water to document the number and types of corals within this quadrat area and look at those changes through time. And you see from the little graphic that even starting in the 1970s, you start to see this loss of coral cover over this 30 year period on the Great Barrier Reef that was quite concerning. Since then, digital photography has come a long way, scuba diving has come a long way, and, and all of the sorts of housings that we can use to bring those cameras underwater to get better images has vastly improved. And what I'm gonna walk you through here are a couple of examples of how imagery has really advanced. And the first is on the left here. At the top there is a picture of an island, and you can see those colorful tracks going around the island, and then these are data sets below that. What has happened here is it's called a toad diver survey, where a scuba diver is literally attached by a bit of line to the back of a boat and towed behind it. You feel a little bit like shark bait when you're doing this. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a pretty effective method for covering a huge amount of area. And you have a video camera that you're pulling along behind and can just film the reef floor and then go back and analyze what was present in those images. So it it's, can cover a lot of area, but with very low resolution, you just get a flash of what's there as you go by. The other more commonly employed technique is similar to what Joe Connell was doing with the photo quadrant method, but now you bring that whole thing underwater and you can go 30, 40 feet down to take images at a specific place that you've demarked over time from year to year. So you can look at changes in coral size or the numbers of and new types and species, specifically species of corals that are arriving in these plots. So there's a trade-off here between these two techniques. One gives you high resolution but low spatial coverage. Each of those images isn't much bigger than the size of a school desk. The other you can cover miles or kilometers of reef but at a really low resolution. Even more recently, in the past five years, a method's been developed called photo mosaicing. This is a pretty cool technique that can either be done by a scuba diver or set up by an ROV, a remotely operated robotic vehicle that can travel around underwater and take images. What you have is two cameras set in stereo. These are both high resolution cameras. And as this, either the ROV or the diver moves along the reef, you're taking rapid photos in series. Then when you bring those images back up, you have a a software technician stitched together each of those images to create a giant mosaic plot that covers an area just about the size of this opera house floor here. So here's an example of one of those stitched together plots that you can take. It was, this was taken from a really remote place in the, called the Line Islands that's south of Hawaii in the Central Pacific. And what's very cool about these images is it gives you that broader view so you can really look at species interactions um, in, in a large sense, but it also, because each of those images was a single high resolution photo, you can zoom in and see even to the level of a coral polyp in each one of those images. So it gives you both the big spatial picture and the smaller view. It's a very cool technique. Now, the problem that you start to run into as a researcher is the same that maybe NSA is facing where they've collected too much data and they don't know what to do with it or how to analyze it. And actually, biologists started taking a page from the National Securities Playbook and used facial recognition software to start identifying the coral species in these images for rapid analysis of these huge data sets. So this is a very cool new approach. This literally has been only developed in the past year, and it's been going through a lot of ground truthing to make sure that the species identifications are correct, but it's a pretty cool technique. Those are all ways to image what's under the water, but of course satellite imagery and aerial photography can give us a bigger picture. So this is off the coast of Australia, and you can zoom in and really start to get an idea of how the land-sea interface can affect coral reefs. So you can see down here this plume of runoff coming over the reef, and you can start to get an idea of which patch reefs in the system may be affected. And you can zoom in even closer and take a look at, at how those patries are holding up over time. Okay, so if you haven't got the chance to get to a coral reef lately, or you're worried about being able to see one that's really intact, there are new methods to getting yourself on a reef from your 
couch, the comfort of your couch. Google Maps is using Street View now to start creating images of reefs across the Great Barrier Reef and in the Philippines, elsewhere, to give everyone access to the beauty of these ecosystems. And uh, it's a pretty cool tool to start doing outreach or um, educating public who can't reach these locations about the sensitivity of these systems and the diversity that exists there. And it's just pretty fun to play with. So I encourage you to take a look if you haven't seen this before. It's more or less a self-guided tour of the coral reefs. There's the website. They're also working with scientists to use this tool to document changes in reefs over time. So, whoops. Let me pull back up the talk. Okay, so the perspective on reefs hasn't only been from this kind of macro view of where the organisms that we can see and get our hands on and feel and, and document through time. We've also gone microscopic in our vision of how coral reefs function. And we've begun to get a greater appreciation for the fact that even though this is gin clear water that's over coral reefs, it's not completely devoid of, of other biota. Um, suspended in the water column. Especially marine bacteria and viruses are more resplendent on these reefs than, than were once considered. Not only are they floating around in the water column, but they're also attached to the surfaces of corals and actually embedded within the tissues of corals. And the recognition of this has actually changed our definition of what a coral is. We no longer call it a symbiont. We started calling it a holobiont because there are so many different organisms involved in the maintenance and function of a single coral colony. So you have the, the mouth feeding apparatus, the tissue that's on the surface of the skeleton. Even on top of that is a layer of mucus that within it contains different types of bacteria and viruses that can act antagonistically or symbiotically with the coral. And within the gut or the gastrodermal cavity of a coral, just like in, in our guts, there's another um, consortium of different microbes that exist there. And even embedded within the calcium carbonate skeleton below the live tissue of the coral is another assortment of my, uh, microbes. And understanding how all of these different parts of the organism interact is very complex and is just a brand new science that's opened up in past years. So understanding the biology and the, the health of a single coral colony can give us a picture of the current conditions, but corals are also really useful recorders of environmental history in the past. So much like the growth of trees and tree rings can record climatology of that region or rainfall in that region. Corals can tell us the same thing. So what researchers do is dive down onto a reef and use a large drilling apparatus to bore into a coral and remove the, um, the core from that coral, the calcium carbonate skeleton beneath that live tissue. And they plug up the hole to make sure that the, there's not a lot of death associated with this approach. But what they do is bring back this core to get it CAT scanned. And actually, the first researchers, researchers who used this technique would bring their coral core to the local hospital to have it run at the CAT scan there. Now they're buying their own and have them in their research labs, but that was the first approach. And what you can see from one of these cores, one of these 3D reconstructions over here, is the rings, the annual bands that are laid down as that coral grows vertically as it's depositing the calcium carbonate over time. And each of those rings is a different size associated with the growth rate of the coral during that period. And you can count back then and get the age of the coral, but you can also use it to read the past. So um, this is similar to what Rob Dunbar is doing and others are, are finding more recently is that there's an isotopic signature in each one of those rings that is strongly correlated with temperature. So you can look at the oxygen isotope to tell you what temperatures the coral was experiencing hundreds of years ago. And even more recently, people have discovered that boron isotopes can tell you what pH, seawater pH that coral, or in some cases, some seaweeds were experiencing that hundreds of years ago too. It's a very new tool. And that allows us to retrospectively analyze periods before we had sensitive autonomous instrument packages that exist now that are, are planted out on, the, on uh, reefs in a, in a sort of sensor network array. So NOAA, the National Oceanographic um, this, sorry, Administration, 
um, has a series of these moorings across the Central Pacific that are used for the reef watch. And the, specifically, they can tell scientists when there's going to be a temperature anomaly or a temperature spike so that researchers can get out to these reefs and discover what's happening to the corals as a result. They also now, in some cases, can measure acidity. But would you believe it that measuring pH in seawater is actually really difficult to do, especially autonomously with an instrument package? And it was only in the past five years that instruments, reliable instruments, were really developed to do this effectively. Before that, it was dependent on, upon discrete sampling. So there's still advancements being made in terms of these monitoring systems. OK, so I've walked through a lot of technological advancements that have allowed us to gather lots more data from these relatively remote and hard to get to ecosystems in many cases. And now I'd like to walk you through what changes coral reefs have experienced in the past 40 years. And the story generally is not a happy one, especially in the Caribbean. It seems that reefs in the Caribbean have gotten hammered much more strongly than, than those in the Pacific. But you see this general trend happening from the top to the bottom graphics here. Um, that in the 1970s, you could visit a coral reef and it would be 100% live coral cover with numerous fish kind of swimming in and out of the branches of these corals. But you go to visit the exact same location today and it's a rubble pile that's covered in seaweeds and sponges and other sorts of fleshy, gooey tissues. So this has often been referred to as the slippery slope to slime on coral reefs, away from coral domination towards seaweed domination and domination of other fleshy invertebrates. It's not limited to the Caribbean, though. This is pretty much happening on a global scale and even on the Great Barrier Reef, which is often touted as, as the biggest, um, most pristine coral system. And there are many reasons why we are seeing these changes on coral reefs. And I'm going to walk you through some of the, the most likely culprits that scientists have been pointing to over the years. And first, I'm going to focus on those culprits that are from a local um, forcing. So it's, it's mainly driven by people who are living right on the reef and using that eco, those reef ecosystem services and resources and causing these problems. And these problems, in some ways, can be addressed by local management practices. And then I'll move on to how global change also threatens these ecosystems. So the first I'm going to talk about is pollution. And by pollution, I don't mean toxic chemicals getting dumped onto reefs. For coral reefs that have these really clear waters, even the addition of uh, uh, farming kinds of fertilizers, like nitrogen and phosphorus, can really otherwise impact this really clear water ecosystem. So if you go to measure nitrogen and phosphor phosphorus on a coral reef that has no runoff, the machines that we use can barely detect any nitrogen and phosphorus available. So when you start adding even just a little bit, you can tip the balance of the ecosystem. And what happens is this is a close up here of, of a colony of coral. Each of these are the individual polyps interacting with a mat of turfing algae. And this is a, a Common occurrence on coral reefs, there's this never-ending battle for space on reefs between corals and algae. The attachment space is somewhat limiting. And when you add these kind of fertilizers to the reef, you really give the algae an upper hand in this competition. And where corals would normally win, the seaweeds can start overgrowing the coral tissue. And even in a single season or a single event, <coughs> of a, a macroalgal bloom, the coral cover can be completely lost and the reef will be totally dominated by these seaweeds as they grow over the coral and either shade out the, the uh, symbiotic algae within the coral or they um, use toxic chemicals to kill off the coral tissue and interact with them directly. In either case, the consequences, you have algal seaweed, macroalgal seaweed domination that is persistent because it prohibits any new corals from growing up in this mat of seaweeds. Even if there are no nutrients in runoff coming from coastal development, the sedimentation alone can have a pretty severe impact on corals. So you can imagine as this fine sediment from coastal development comes over a reef, it can smother the corals both in terms of preventing those, um, those polyps from filter feeding from the water column and also shading out the symbiotic zooxanthellae bound within the corals and actually 
one of Charles Yench's later publications from even 2002 was looking specifically at this interaction between sedimentation, irradiance, or light availability, and how corals can maintain their, their um, photosynthesis in, in the face of sedimentation. Coastal runoff can bring other things to the reef too, including diseases. So there's been larger and larger widespread documentation of diseases appearing on coral reefs that affect both the corals in the top row there, and then calcareous algae, the kinds of fills that space in between corals and acts to cement the reef. So these are a completely different kind of algae that have a low profile, don't generally overgrow corals, but act to pull the reef together. They're also calcareous. The sources and, and drivers of these diseases is still really difficult to pinpoint, and in many cases, identifying, and call, uh, identifying the exact disease can be really difficult alone. But I worked with some researchers recently to identify the coralline fungal disease. And through some genetic comparisons, we found that this fungus is really closely related to what's called a smut fungi, which is a fungus that affects plant crops too. So that points to the source of this disease coming from land-based pollution. There are other um, mechanisms by which people have, ac people's activity has affected coral reefs also. And what I'm gonna walk you through now is a really cool study done by Laura McClenahan, who's a professor, a new professor at Colby College. And actually we were finishing up together at the same time at Scripps Institution of Oceanography in California before we both moved back to East. And this was her dissertation work there. So I'll walk you through it briefly. What she did was a retrospective analysis of images taken from the Florida Keys from fishing, um, sport fishing vessels that went out. And they documented each day that they went out how many passengers they took and what kinds of fish they caught. And she could measure the size of the fish from these images and, and identify them as well. So she went through several decades, the 1950s to the 1970s here of, of information and, and was able to count all of these fish and get an idea of the amount of effort being put into this fish capture. And by today, you can see that despite the greater fishing effort that happens with the newer you know, apparatuses for, for uh, fishing, fish finders and whatnot, the numbers of fish getting caught on the reef are much less and the sizes are much smaller. This is due to, especially on, in places where people are subsistence living off of the fish resources that the coral reefs can provide, is due to harmful fishing practices, generally including overharvest, destructive fishing, so practices like dynamite fishing are, can still be common in some locations. This is where fishers literally throw a stick of dynamite onto the reef, blow it up, and then all the dead fish flow to the surface. It's a very easy fishing practice, but you can see the kind of devastation that it leaves behind. Beyond that, just simply fishing down the food chain can cause big problems on a reef. So as, as the predatory fish that are kind of more tasty, the, the groupers and bass, get over-harvested. Fishers start collecting the smaller herbivorous fish, and this is where the rubber really hits the road in terms of impacts on coral reefs. So just to give you an idea of how pervasive this, this um, fishing effect is, I have a simple graphic here that was compiled by a graduate student who was in, working in the lab I left at, at Scripps, and he used um, global database of all the fish counts that researchers have been done, been doing ac across, uh, this was I think focused on the, the Pacific. But what you have is, oh, let me see if I can point to it here. The, this smaller bar here is the fisheries accessible regions and the larger bar there is the fisheries non-accessible regions, meaning areas that are protected, marine protected areas, or are so remote that people are not fishing off of them, they can't get to them. And you can see that there's about a third as many fish on the reefs where they're being actively fished as compared to others. Why is this so critical to coral reefs? Well, herbivores really keep the balance in these systems. They act like lawn mowers to mow down the seaweeds before they're able to grow up and over the corals. And so often where you have large abundances of these reef herbivores, well, you also have greater abundance of corals, a larger coral cover. So there's a, a distinct relationship between the amount of herbivores on the reef and the health of that system. 
So as researchers were watching in the 90s and beyond, the degradation happening on coral reefs and the, this phase shift, it was, it was called, from the domination by reef building calcifiers to domination by fleshy species. They started wondering, is there any way that we can, we can return these systems to their previous state? And how can we protect what is left? So I'm going to walk you through quickly now two approaches, science-based reef management approaches that have been taken in the last five years to, uh, based on, on the knowledge gained from some, from some of these studies. And the first example comes from the island of Maui in, in Hawaii. And right up here in this upper corner at the, right off the Lahaina Resort there, was established the first ever herbivore enhancement area. So this is a very small marine protected area whose only purpose is to preserve different species of reef fish and sea urchins. So otherwise, it's an actively used area for recreation, um, especially by people visiting that resort. But it's protected for just these species. And there's several graduate students and researchers working out there now following the trajectory of the corals and the macroalgae and the balance between those two after the establishment of this reserve. On a much larger scale is the development of a huge protected area called the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. And I don't know if, if you all are aware of this, but it's something that George Bush instilled on his way out of office in 2008. He set aside these islands and atolls and reefs as protected areas. These are actually part of the US protectorate. So they're US um, property floating out there in the Central Pacific. And actually, just today, I signed a letter of support with other researchers working in this area to um, President Barack Obama, who's just proposed expanding each of these areas to be beyond just the 50 miles from shore boundary to 200 miles from shore boundary, which would actually create the world's largest marine sanctuary. And you might ask, why are we concerned about protecting these really remote locations? Well, first of all, there's no people living on most of these islands, so they've experienced very little impact um, that I just described, like the pollution kinds of runoff issues or overfishing. So they really represent the last wild, remote, pristine reefs that we have in the Central Pacific. And they're a pretty wild and woolly place. They're wonderful to visit and do research. They have some of the highest abundances of coral reef fish, coral cover, and the invertebrates associated with them. But they're not immune to the global threats that could affect reefs today. And so I'm going to walk you through quickly what some of those global threats are and why we're concerned about them. So these global threats are a consequence of the release of greenhouse gas emissions since the Industrial Revolution. And many of you may be aware of the one consequence, which is the warming of the oceans, um, as the oceans have absorbed 95% of all the heat emitted thus far, or added thus far to the lower atmosphere. And what you may not know is a warming of even 2 degrees Celsius can really affect coral biology. <clears throat> and I'll walk through how that happens in a minute. The other CO2 problem, as it's referred to, is ocean acidification. And this has been one of my areas of expertise for the past couple of years. So for those of you who aren't familiar, although I suspect many of you have heard this before, as carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean, and, and the ocean has absorbed about 30% of the atmospheric carbon dioxide that we've added to date, it becomes more acidic through a chemical process that um, creates carbonic acid that dis dissociates into hydrogen ions, and those hydrogen ions are what's making the, the water more acidic. What happens is seawater pH will drop from a level about 8.1 in the tropics to 7.8, which may seem like a small infinitesimal decrease, but you have to remember that pH is measured on the same logarithmic scale as an earthquake as the Richter scale, so even this small change can have huge consequences for organisms, especially those that calcify, because as that pH drops, so does the availability of the carbonate ion. And that's the basic building block for building a calcium carbonate skeleton for corals, for oysters, for a whole plethora of organisms that create this hard skeletal structure. So this is uh, that kind of a drop in pH, and that little of a drop uh, raise in temperature is enough to really affect coral biology. So first I'll review how it affects, temperature affects corals. When a coral becomes thermally stressed, 
it either, and the, the jury's still out here, it either expels its symbiotic zooxanthellae or they choose to leave. In either case, this process is called coral bleaching. If the t temperature stress or the thermal anomaly is short-lived, then the coral can reabsorb those symbiotic zooxanthellae and go on living, although it may have had a setback in, in terms of its growth. However, if that stress is prolonged for two weeks or longer, then that dissociation between the two symbionts can become permanent. And without that extra food source from the dinoflagellate, the symbiotic algae, the coral eventually dies and becomes overgrown by algae, by other seaweeds, by the, the macroalgae. This is why NOAA has those buoys strewn out across the Pacific to measure temperature and, and warn us when an event is going to be a prolonged one so we can look for, for evidence of coral bleaching. The other CO2 problem, acidification, affects the ability of coral reef animals and plants to make the hard parts, the carbonate minerals, including the aragonite, calcite, and magnesium calcite. Those are all the different types of minerals that corals and seaweeds incorporate into their skeleton. And those minerals will be harder to produce as ocean acidification proceeds. So here's just a really nice visual created by some people at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. This is a single coral polyp. This is a very young coral, just in its singular stage before it comes a colony. And these are four different polyps that have been subjected to different levels of seawater pH and decreasing carbonate ion concentration. And you can see their development is really affected by, um, by these conditions. Essentially, what's happening is the global warming process will cause bleaching in several different reef calcifying organisms and essentially give these calcifiers osteoporosis. So it makes the uh, carbonate skeleton more brittle, um, less dense, and it makes it harder to develop. So you can imagine what this might mean for the stability of the reef framework that builds the 3D structure, that this 3D structure is so important for the biodiversity on coral reefs. And in fact, we may be seeing evidence of the effect of acidification and warming already. So here's a study using that coral coring technique that I, I described to you earlier along the coast of Australia. And each of these circles represents an area where a core was taken from, from a coral reef. And this first graphic I want you to look at up here in the corner shows the calcification rate measured by the annual changes in the bands in those corals as they grew vertically. And you can see in the late 90s, there was just a precipitous drop in the calcification rate of these corals. And what many fear is that we've already, in some instances, passed these all-important thresholds of 2 degrees Celsius on this axis, or above, in some cases, 400 parts per million carbon dioxide in the water column, which is equivalent to a, a drop in seawater pH. So we've moved past this state of today and we're starting to reach this state where, because we're passing these thresholds, reefs may no longer be dominated by corals. So these types of coring approaches give you a great retrospective analysis. And you can do some exper experiments to get a window into the future, but it doesn't really give you an idea of the capacity for corals to adapt and acclimate to these rapidly changing conditions. So what, I, what many have done and what I became a part of just this May was an expedition with NOAA to MOG, which is an island in the Marianas chain. In the Marianas chain, Marianas area may be familiar to you because of the, the trench, which is the deepest part of the world's ocean. But right next to us, right next to it must be some of the highest mountains in the world's ocean because they pierce the, the um, sea level at that point. There are 15 volcanic mountains that, that can pierce through the surface of the ocean. And in this chain, we send researchers to fly into Saipan where they join the NOAA ship and cruise up to this island called Mog. Just to give you an idea of how active these volcanoes still are, on, the, on that transit from Saipan to Mog, they documented uh, this volcano on the island of Pagan still expelling fumes, plumes of gas, which makes you a little bit worried about going diving in that area, but they managed. And the reason to go to Mog is because it's a flooded caldera with this submarine volcano that's still 
slightly active in terms of the fact that it has CO2 vents that are seeping actively into the water column just in this reef area. So it makes it a really cool study site. This, these seeps have been going on for quite some time and it gives you an idea of how reefs may adapt in that immediate area. So what, they, what researchers, our group started doing immediately upon arrival was literally using instruments to map out the pH levels in and around those vents. This is what it looks like when you dive on those reefs. You can see streams of carbon dioxide bubbles coming up from these CO2 seeps. So these kinds of locations are often referred to as champagne reefs. There's, there's a handful of them in the world. And they provide this really cool study system. So we went and put out some of those newly developed autonomous instrumentation to measure uh, seawater pH and temperature, and found that right near those seeps, the pH is about 7.8 now, which is similar to what we expect conditions to change to in the next 100 years based on the International Panel for Climate Change predictions, projections. So we did some experiments in this location too. We transplanted corals near to and far from the vents so we could get an idea of the immediate physiological reaction to these, to these conditions. And actually, a student that I've been working with is on her way literally today to go back and pick up those transplants and, and those instruments that are sitting out on that reef. What we did discover from this first adventure, based on um, image analysis, was that coral cover and diversity is really low inside the caldera, where the CO2 vent activity is the highest. And that's an, an idea of what the, the landscape looks like there. It looks kind of like that slippery slope to slime that I was talking about. But outside the caldera, coral cover is much higher and, um, and more diverse. And that's shown here by the size of the larger circles on the outside. The story isn't all that terribly depressing, though, because there are a few species of corals that are growing in and around the CO2 vents. In fact, some of the vents even come up through a coral. So clearly there are species that exist that are capable of adapting or acclimatizing to these conditions. And what's really interesting is that these same species are the ones that we find in experiments that are unaffected by elevated PCO2 treatment. So this, this gives us some hope that there may be a few species that can make it through these conditions. But given that, generally speaking, we understand that calcification is going to decline on coral reefs, and that means that the vertical accretion of these reefs will likely decrease at the same time sea level rise is happening. So what does that mean for these really shallow ecosystems on which millions of people depend for their natural resources and for living? And I'll take a break here for a minute and show you a video specifically addressing this issue. So we're always within we sight of the sea. You're always, always 24 hours of the day in your sleep. You're listening to the sound of the president of the small island nation describing his area. Kiribati, the T-I is pronounced like an S, is a group of 33 coral islands in the Pacific Ocean. It's the only country in the world with territory in all four hemispheres. Most of its 100,000 citizens spend their days fishing, drying coconut meat, and hanging out in the Maneva, the community hut. But within a few decades, the country of Kiribati will be completely underwater. Sea levels are rising because of climate change, meaning Kiribati, where the average elevation is less than seven feet, is drowning. The impacts of climate change cover a wide spectrum from those that will not even feel it for the next 200 years to those who are feeling it yesterday. And we're at that end of the, 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 the spectrum. Early this year, we had a series of high tides which were beyond the predictions on the chat. So they were off the chat. Some of our communities have had to leave their villages because the village is gone. Most heads of state focus on how to grow their country's economy. President Anote Tong has to figure out what will happen to his people when their country is gone. For now, the government is building seawalls. But Tong says that will only delay the inevitable. Next, there's what he calls slow evacuation. That means training Kiribati's traditional subsistence farmers to be nurses or mechanics, so they're eligible for skilled worker immigration to another country. But that only takes care of about 75 people a year. 
In the longer term, the government might be planning to move the entire population of Kiribati to Fiji. In May, Kiribati bought nearly 6,000 acres on the island of Vanuatu. The president says the land will be used for agricultural purposes for now. During a visit to Kiribati earlier this year, the, the president of Fiji offered on behalf of his people that, that, that they would be will, willing to accommodate our people if necessary. That is perhaps the most refreshing reaction that I've ever had. There's also the possibility of floating islands in Kiribati waters. A Japanese company is developing massive so-called floating lily pads that could house up to 30,000 people each. But priced in the billions, Tong says his country couldn't afford them without international help. And uh, that is an out-of-the-box solution. It seems so science fiction at the moment. But if you don't have a choice, and if that is the only choice, what would you do? Okay. So a bit depressing, but the reality is for some places that they're already feeling these impacts. Now I'm going to try to get to the more hopeful part of the talk. <laughs> Oops, sorry. And I want to mention a couple of projects that I have going on. First is we're trying to move beyond just measuring and counting the number of corals that are there or disappearing in some cases. And we've developed a system to measure essentially the health of a small area of reef about the size of the stage. And we tested this system recently in Kaneohe Bay on Oahu, and you can see how unpleasant of a place it is to work, <laughs> based on the smile pasted on Yui's face there. We worked just in a shallow reef area to give this system a try. And here's us installing the system. Essentially, it's a frame with a series of instruments mounted to it that can measure the flux of pH and oxygen from the reef floor up to the surface and determine how that um, gets ejected across the reef based on a series of complicated equations, which you don't really need to understand. All you need to know is that this essentially is a giant stethoscope for a reef. So we can use it to measure the daily pulse of net ecosystem calcification and primary production, or essentially the ability for that reef to inhale and exhale carbon dioxide. And what we've been doing is testing this now across a couple of reef systems, including the Florida Keys on Oahu, we just tested it last week in Bermuda, all to prepare us for going to some more remote places like Palmyra Atoll to give it a test. And it can give you a better sense of the capacity for that reef to absorb carbon dioxide or at least cope with excess carbon dioxide and determine whether that reef is going to continue net calcifying or dissolving in the future. So what will coral reefs of the future look like? Are we stuck with this scenario where everything goes to the slippery slope of, of slime, or is there the hope that some reef systems will be more resilient? We are learning hopeful lessons from some pristine reefs, like those in the Phoenix Island chain. So the Phoenix Island got hammered by one of those um, long warming events in the early 2000s, and the reef was completely knocked back. Everything bleached. However, if there's enough sources nearby, a source population of corals that's releasing larvae to the water column that can reach these reefs, you get small settlers or recruits like this, that if your system has enough herbivorous fish to maintain the algal population from taking over, allows these corals to grow up six years later and become as abundant and huge as they were before and create that 3D structure. So this is telling us that areas that are managed locally for things like overfishing or pollution on the reef can actually be more, more robust or resilient to these climate changes than, than we thought. I also worked with a group of researchers to compile a database of the appearance of new corals on reefs, given the relative importance for this process for replenishing reefs after catastrophic events. And the goals were to retrospectively evaluate decadal scale trends in coral recruitment and project those into a future warmer and more acidic ocean. The way that researchers measure the number of new corals appearing on a reef is really actually quite basic. You just put out settlement tiles on the reef on scuba. 
So these are just flat surfaces that are made either of carbonate themselves, of plastic, or even terracotta tiles have been used in many cases. You leave them out on the reef for several months to up to a year and let them become fouled or encrusted with all the organisms that appear and are searching for that bare attachment space that can be so rare on coral reefs. And you bring those tiles back to the lab and then use microscopic techniques to just count the number of newly appearing recruits on those surfaces and you get a density or concentration of corals per, per meter squared there. And so what we did was went back through the database or created a database from all the pub published literature where researchers have been deploying these settlement tiles over the past 40 years. And you don't need to understand the colors on this graphic, just focus on these, these points here and you see that researchers have been working globally and in many diverse locations to, dis to deploy these, um, these settlement tiles. And what we've learned from changes on the numbers of, of corals appearing on those settlement tiles over time is first that coral recruits have been disappearing since the 1980s in the tropics where corals traditionally, reefs have traditionally been built. However, and this is the really interesting part, as you move polewards away from the equator, coral recruits have become more abundant since the early 2000s. So it seems as though they are experiencing an equatorial retraction, but a poleward expansion. They're following their thermal envelope as it moves away from the equator. And what this suggests is that we may be looking for environmental refuge corals that are appearing at new locations in the futures to come. And my husband's kind of hoping that by the time we're ready to retire, there'll be some reefs off the coast of Maine here that he can <laughs> find a decent surf break. But <laughs> I don't know, we'll hold off and see if that happens. And with that note, I'd like to end and, and just take any questions if you have them.